microscopic anatomy of body tissues. Remember, tissues are just a bunch of cells put together. So we'll look at, uh, in essence, kind of the arrangement of the cells. So that's kind of what we're going for with tissues. And the arrangement of the cells determines what type of tissue we're looking at. And then we'll look at some locations and examples of, of where we'd find uh, some of these tissues. So uh, again, we're going to go through these. There's, there's, it's it's kind of bulky, but um, that's why I, the lab we create for Thursday is going to have uh, a lot more um, uh, meat to it. Maybe not meat. It's it's gonna it's gonna just add more to what we go through. So tissues are going to be. Uh, uh, I'm just telling you right now, they're uh, they're categorized by how the cells are arranged. And so uh, we can simplify things quite a bit with tissues. So that's what our goal is today uh, and Thursday. Um, what we're not going to do much of Thursday is talk about skin. So um, I want to spend quite a bit of our time together today going through uh, the different layers of skin, uh, keratinization, uh, UV radiation, uh, the acid mantle on the surface of the skin, that basically uh, a film that helps uh, for protection. And one of the uh, primary functions of the skin uh, is protection. And then, of course, uh, body temperature regulation, which we saw in our heart hyperthermia um, case study. And then certainly uh, skin sensa you know, sensations uh, and how the skin uh, is connected with the nervous system uh, as a sensory mechanism, going all the way back to week one and homeostasis and week two, uh, discussing some of the basics of homeostasis, that sensory coming in to the control center, motor going out, well, that sensory coming in uh, oftentimes is going to be uh, picked up by the skin. Um, and then uh, we'll discuss a little bit with injury uh, and repair. Um, and then Thursday, the, the one aspect we do look at a little bit, maybe more with tissue repair, uh, uh, but also skin repair, uh, we'll look at a little bit with visible body uh, as well on Thursday. So let's get uh, into tissues chapter four. Uh, again, it, quite simply, it's a bunch of cells put together. It's our next level of organization. Again, going back to week one, we had our chemical level, and then we got into our cellular and organelles level, and then now we're at the tissue level. Um, and those cells uh, in some of these tissues uh, are going to be uh, kind of floating around and, and suspended in what we call a matrix. Uh, we're all maybe suspended in the matrix, right? Um, so we're just a bunch of cells. So uh, in that respect, yeah, the, the matrix is kind of like the negative space. It's the, it's the uh, uh, if you, you get into the swimming pool, you are the cell and the water around you in the pool is considered to be the matrix. <clears throat> So the matrix is simply uh, the, the area that the cells are immersed in. We call, also call it the extracellular matrix. Extra means outside of, not more than. It means like exit. So extracellular, outside the cells, uh, is a matrix. And that matrix we'll take a look at in a little more detail coming up in a few minutes. Uh, and again, on Thursday, we'll see more uh, with the ECM or the extracellular matrix and, and what it's comprised of. Um, the four different types of, of tissues are, again, going to be classified primarily on their structures and how the cells are arranged. Uh, the first uh, tissue type we look at and really probably spend most of our time on is what we call epithelial or epithelial tissue. Epi or EPI as a prefix means upon something, upon something. Um, <clears throat> we'll see with the skin today, the, the outer layer of, of skin is called the uh, epidermis. So the epidermis is going to be comprised of epithelial tissue. Epithelium is always going to be found on something or upon something. It's typically seen as a lining inside the body. So in the body, we have all kinds of different tubes. Uh, you'll hear the word tract, T-R-A-C-T, from time to time, especially later on in the, in the semester. Uh, but all of the tubes in our bodies 
are going to have a lining of some sort. And this lining uh, is covered or comprised of epithelium. Uh, and then if it's a covering, so like the skin of the, uh, the, the outer layer of the skin, the epidermis is a covering, we also consider that to be epithelial. So epithelium is a lining uh, or a covering. Okay, um, connective tissue, we'll, so we'll look at the different types of epithelium uh, shortly. Connective tissue uh, is typically found deep to uh, epithelial tissues. Connective tissue connects in essence. So we'll take a look at that as well in, in a little bit more, more detail. We're kind of working uh, from superficial to deep. Again, epithelial is going to be the superficial most layer or, or layers. Okay? So the, the superficial most uh, tissue layer is generally going to be epithelial just deep to the epithelium or just underneath it is going to be connective tissue. Um, and connective tissue, generally, we're going to see a blood supply uh, with connective tissue. And we don't usually see much in the way of a blood supply with epithelial tissue. Um, and then underneath or deep to connective tissue, uh, we typically see some sort of muscle tissue. And we'll look at the three different types of muscle tissue. And then lastly, nervous tissue kind of uh, uh, probably of, of all four of these, uh, the nervous system is most well, the most complicated system probably that we'll we'll study both this semester and next semester. But nervous tissue happens to be the simplest uh, of these four. Uh, we really only look at a couple of different features with nervous tissue, um, and then certainly in about four weeks we're going to spend quite a bit of time uh, again discussing nervous tissue. So we won't really spend a heck of a lot of time uh, either today or. Thursday discussing too much with nervous tissue, um, but uh, what we do discuss is, is only a couple of things. These other ones are a little bit beefier, especially epithelial. So, um, so we'll get into to the four different tissue types and then kind of the subcategories underneath each type here in just a second. So again, you're going to want to know and etch into your long-term brains that we have four primary tissue types. Epithelial tissue, which is generally superficial and it's a lining or a covering. And then deep to that or underneath epithelium, we have what's called connective tissue. And we'll see a few different types of connective tissue. Uh, we typically see this, uh, a matrix, when we're dealing with connective tissue. So one of the, the key features coming up when we get into more detail about connective tissue is cells in a matrix. So, uh, so keep that in mind. Typically with, with epithelium, we're talking about cells that are going to be stacked on top of one another because they're a lining or a covering. Whereas the connective tissue underneath or deep to that epithelial lining or covering is generally going to be cells suspended in uh, some sort of a matrix. So uh, we'll keep that in mind as well uh, as we go, especially as we get to the matrix here. Again, uh, and then the third type is muscular tissue, and then the fourth type uh, is nervous tissue. So anyway, those are the four main tissue types. You want to have these etched in pretty good uh, long term, and, and certainly we will reinforce uh, this terminology and this knowledge uh, throughout the semester. Because remember, every uh, body system that we cover is going to be comprised of organs, and all of those organs are going to be made up of specific tissues. Okay. So anyhow, the extracellular matrix or the ECM, uh, again, we're going to see some tissues with a large amount of this extracellular matrix, the kind of the, the fluid material uh, between cells. Um, some tissues have a lot, some tissues have very little to no uh, extracellular matrix. So um, here's a, a an illustration, a kind of a diagrammatic breakdown of what we might see in the extracellular matrix. First of all, uh, by now, I hope all of you recognize uh, this uh, little item uh, across the bottom with all these little globes and little tails uh, as the uh, 
plasma membrane, or even more specifically, we could call it the phospholipid bilayer uh, of the plasma membrane. Okay, so we see the cell membrane, and then remember these guys embedded in, in there are those integral membrane proteins. Okay, integral imps, right? Integral membrane proteins. And then uh, you want to remember too that, uh, that that cell membrane is primarily lipid-based, and we do see some cholesterol molecules in there. Okay, and then we we go inside the cell, we would be in what where we the area we would be in would be called intracellular or inside of the cell. So again, we're going to spend our time outside of the cell. We're moving on a little bit uh, from cytoplasm and cytoskeleton and nucleus and ribosome and, and rough ER and smooth ER and Golgi and all. We're moving a little bit past that and now looking outside the cell membrane. And outside of that cell membrane is what we call an extracellular matrix. Okay, and that matrix you can see ECM here. They also call the, the fluid part of this, they'll call extracellular fluid. So we, we see ECF oftentimes, and you, you guys all learned last week and the week before in chemistry and then cells that uh, sodium ions, for one, uh, are found in high volumes in that extracellular fluid uh, contained in that extracellular matrix. So you can see that term ECF or extracellular fluid, that's gonna be the fluid portion of the matrix. And then within that matrix, we see what are called proteoglycans. Okay, so proteins and glucose. Okay. Glycoprotein. Um, typically, the, the, the kind of the base word or the foundation word. So what's the difference between a proteoglycan and a glycoprotein? They're both glucose and protein. Well, generally speaking, the, the word at the end is going to be the, the kind of the anchor or the, the aspect that has the majority or the bulk uh, content. And then the, the, the term in front oftentimes is going to be what's attached to, uh, to that, that item. So I guess you'd say the primary feature or the primary macromolecule of the proteoglycan would be uh, the glyco part or the glucose. Uh, a glycoprotein, the primary macromolecule would be the protein aspect with a, a secondary uh, feature being glucose or some sort of, of, of carbohydrate chain. Um, so anyway, uh, most of the extracellular matrix uh, uh, structures are, go are going to be protein-based. You can see collagen fibers. You've probably all heard of collagen at some point point in your lives. Collagen is a, is a protein fiber that's found in the extracellular space as part of that ECM or extracellular matrix. Collagen fibers provide uh, durability, strength, um, a little bit of flexibility, but we see a different fiber called elastin. It's like the word elastic but with an N on the end instead of a C. So elastin instead of elastic. That's a type of, of fiber we also find uh, in the extracellular matrix. And, and again, elastin would provide more elasticity or flexibility uh, within the, the tissues uh, of the, when we find it in the extracellular matrix, whereas collagen will provide more durability uh, and more strength and, and more support. So, um, so anyway, there's, that's what's going on in the extracellular matrix. We've got a lot of action, right? It's not just simply a, a bunch of water out here and then we get to the cells. No, no, we have some, some, quite a bit of water, but we also have several 
uh, uh, structures that are going to be protein based. So the primary components again are going to be uh, water uh, as part of that uh, uh, extracellular matrix and then proteins uh, primarily again structural uh, proteins uh, such as collagen and then there's that term elastin. We're going to see glycoproteins, proteoglycans as, uh, as well. Okay, so we're going to see uh, sugars uh, attached to proteins. These allow for communication. We mentioned that a little bit last week when we talked about uh, uh, macro, a couple weeks ago, and then again last week with macromolecule combos uh, and where uh, we may find uh, some of those. And again, we see proteoglycans, uh, again, primarily carbohydrates with a protein backbone. So that protein backbone is going to provide a little bit of support, uh, but we also see some specialized uh, activities with uh, one of the most well-known uh, proteoglycans uh, is heparin, uh, which is a type of blood thinner. Uh, that we do see produced uh, by liver cells and uh, released uh, throughout the body to aid uh, with, uh, with uh, during inflammatory responses uh, and for thinning out of the blood. So anyway, we'll talk about some of these in more detail uh, it, uh, when we get to advanced. Okay. Uh, let's see. So single maths, keep going. Tissue repair, uh, we'll look at this as well a little bit more uh, this Thursday, but tissues certainly have uh, uh, the capacity to repair themselves. Most tissues do. Um, there, there may be a few that can't regenerate, uh, a few cells that can't regenerate, but most cells are able to go through mitosis, which we looked at uh, uh, as well a little bit last week. But most cells can regenerate, and therefore we see uh, uh, tissues able to regenerate. Um, we also, uh, we're, we're going to see some phagocytic cells as well. These are kind of the, the, uh, the cleanup crew that comes in uh, to help with uh, uh, not only cleaning up some of the, the debris from the, the actual damage, but to also clean up some of the debris that comes about during the repair process. So just like if you're fixing uh, anything, if you're repairing anything in the real world, you're gonna have some waste left over. So, um, so there's always waste. So you're, you're repairing something potentially because there's been damage and that damage has its own waste. So the phagocytes can get that out of there. And then once I start repairing the tissue, I have some leftovers and some empty containers and some, some, some debris that, that's been created during that construction and repair process. So phagocytic cells also will clean the, up uh, the debris from, from the repair. So um, dead cells, injured cells uh, uh, get replaced. Uh, with uh, what we call scar tissue. Um, and typically, again, we're going to see a lot of collagen fibers. Collagen provides a lot of strength uh, and durability. Uh, so scar tissue uh, is usually going to be a, a large collection uh, of dense collagen. Uh, and, and that can inhibit uh, flexibility. It can in inhibit range of motion. Uh, scar tissue is uh, natural. We have what are called microadhesions or tiny adhesions that you don't even really see. Uh, the, it, so on the cellular level, our bodies are constantly uh, creating scar tissue to repair any type of micro tears or micro adhesions. And then if those micro tears or adhesions become larger and more macro scale, then certainly we would see more scar tissue. And, and at that point, possibly uh, some limitations in range of motion, limitations in uh, blood supply or blood flow. Um, so one of the first things that we do see is a blood clot forming. Uh, if that uh, if that tissue damage, by the way, too, you know, remember epithelium is the lining or the covering. There's not really a blood supply uh, in, in the epithelium itself. So if we have just kind of like a scrape or an abrasion that doesn't go past the epidermis, we're going to see we're not going to see a blood clot more than likely. 
um, once we've we've drawn blood or we see blood on the surface, it means we've gone past that epithelial covering and gone down into the connective tissue layers. Um, the connective tissue layers are where we find the blood vessels. Uh, and again, uh, if we penetrate that connective tissue layer where the blood vessels are, are formed, uh, we're going to need to uh, repair, uh, we're going to need to stop the bleeding first. Uh, so a blood clot's going to form. And uh, when, when we, next semester especially, but a little bit this semester, uh, even this week, we'll talk a little bit about blood. And then toward the end of the semester, when we get to the cardiovascular system, we'll talk about blood uh, in quite a bit more detail. Uh, but anyway, this is just kind of a teaser trailer uh, of blood. And, and these are called capillaries, these little blood vessels. And uh, so anyway, we need to stop the bleeding. So a blood clot will form. And then we have what are called germinating cells from the epithelial lining uh, that are going to basically uh, go through kind of like a hypermitotic phase. They're going to go through mitosis a little bit faster than normal uh, to, to really start the process of repairing that tissue. So uh, the germinativum or the germinating layer is going to... Uh, zoom uh, through mitosis and create uh, a little bit more uh, of a lining uh, or of a, of a layer of cells. And then uh, at some point, we're going to have some other specialized uh, blood chemicals that will dissolve the blood clot uh, and get that out of there. And then uh, we have a little bit of scar tissue uh, in the connective tissue. Um, the scar tissue that's, that's here down in the CT or the connective tissue area uh, is more prevalent than, than maybe what we'd see uh, uh, in the epithelial layers, although certainly scars are visible. Um, but generally, the epithelial cells uh, are pretty uh, hypermitotic anyway. I shouldn't say hypermitotic. They, they go through mitosis. Uh, on a regular set point at a little bit faster pace than connective tissue cells. So uh, epithelial tissues used to being damaged or going through some abrasive uh, issues. So, um, so anyway, we will see more of this uh, on Thursday. We'll see more of it next semester uh, as well. So let's move in to and spend a few minutes on the the four different tissue types. We're gonna start with epithelial tissue. It is the bulkiest, it has the most going on. That epithelial tissue um, will have some new terminology, but again, Thursday we'll, we'll, we'll work through it even more. Uh, connective tissue uh, and then muscle and nerve. And from there, we're gonna jump into the skin a little bit and then uh, um, That'll be that for the day. So with epithelial uh, tissue, we're going to see either membranous or glandular uh, types. We're going to primarily focus on membranes. Membranous, remember, uh, these are going to be some sort of a covering uh, of, of a body cavity, potentially, uh, or of some sort of, of hollow organ. So solid organs are going to be covered typically uh, with uh, epithelium. Hollow organs are going to be lined with epithelium. Okay? So and whether it's hollow uh, or a solid organ, it's generally going to be membranous. We do have some uh, uh, glandular aspects uh, as well throughout the body. We'll look at glands. We've seen endocrine and exocrine a little bit already. We're going to go into a little more detail about those terms uh, coming up shortly. Um, functions, uh, either way, uh, membranous or glandular, we're still thinking of epithelium as a lining or a covering. All right. Um, some of the functions, so if it's a lining or a covering and we, we look at the functions, uh, I think the first thing that probably would come to mind is protection. Uh, and then uh, we certainly get into sensory aspects and then we can see some secretion uh, going on, uh, absorption going on, and then excretion or elimination. So we'll look at some of these in more detail uh, again as we go, uh, secretion, ex absorption, and excretion. Uh, limited amount of matrix. So general 
uh, structural features uh, of, about epithelium. Generally, there's little to no matrix. We see typically uh, a lot of cells of different shapes and sizes kind of packed in uh, um, on top of one another or lined up next to one another. So usually we don't see a lot of negative space or a lot of matrix. Um, there, we're also going to see what's called a basement membrane, uh, which simply means, you know, your basement is at the bottom uh, of your home with cells at the, the bottom or the deepest uh, layers uh, of, of cells and of these epithelial cells. Uh, we're going to see a basement membrane that's going to connect or link the epithelial with the connective tissues. So the basement membrane is usually uh, uh, shows up on a microscope and you will be able to see it in, uh, pretty easily uh, under a microscope. It's, it stains very dark. So the basement membrane is, is typically a pretty dark uh, line or stain between the layers of cells uh, of the epithelium and the underlying uh, connective tissue which typically is gonna have cells kind of floating around in a matrix. Okay. The third bullet there, avascular, we talked about that a little bit earlier. Avascular simply has to do with not having a blood supply. So uh, no blood supply to epithelial cells. Uh, they are fed uh, from the connective tissue uh, or from the, the blood supply uh, from the connective tissue. We can feed the cells that are in the, the deepest layers of the epithelium. Um, again, they're in very close proximity. We talked a little bit about desmosomes and tight junctions uh, last week when we talked about uh, cells being connected to one another. So we would see epithelium having a lot more desmosome uh, and tight junction uh, uh, linkage. So um, again, uh, protection uh, is a big deal uh, with epithelium. The epithelial cells are capable of reproduction, certainly. Uh, again, we're used to seeing some sort of, of uh, friction or abrasion or trauma uh, with epithelium, uh, some stress uh, uh, on epithelial cells, and so they need to be capable of, of uh, mitosis and reproduction. Um, again, membranous is, is that covering or lining. And so when we, we talk about the membranous uh, uh, epithelium, we're talking about uh, 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 the primary aspects of really where we're going to be going today and on Thursday. Remember, it's either membranous or glandular. So we're going to spend most of the epithelial talk on membranous. All right, so coverings and linings. Um, we can classify epithelial tissue based on the shapes of the cells uh, and based on the amount of layers or the thickness of the layers of these cells. So based on cell shape, we're going to see what, what are called flat cells or squamous. Squamous means squashed. Uh, cuboidal means cube-shaped. And then columnar means column-shaped. So we have three types uh, of cells in epithelial uh, uh, tissue. The cells are either going to be flat, cubes, or columns. Okay? And then that last one, pseudostratified columns, simply means we're going to see columns, uh, and we may see what appear to be multiple layered columns, but in reality, uh, we're going to see one uh, layer of columns. Um, that's neither here nor there at the moment. So uh, just know these three shapes are possibilities. Okay, flat or squamous. Okay, cube-like or cuboidal, and column-like or columnar. Now the other way of classifying and organizing these cells is by their layers or their, their number of layers or the thickness. Okay, so the number of layers is either gonna be one or multiples. So that's kind of nice. We don't have to get into uh, too many uh, uh, adjectives to describe these cells. It's either gonna be one layer 
simple, or it's going to be multiple layered and what we consider to be stratified. Strata means layer, so stratified means layered, multiple layers. Okay. Now we can put the word simple in front of any of these three shapes. So we can have simple squamous epithelium. Okay. Um, I want to just take a moment if, uh, just for you to breathe for a second and just, you know, I, I, we're, we're entering into some weird terminology here and, and a lot of, of, of stuff that may seem a little bit out there. Um, again, just, just remember that cells can either be flat, cubes, or columns, okay? If they're flat, they're probably not providing much protection unless I pile them on top of one another. That would be a stratified situation. So simple meaning one layer, stratified meaning many layers. So when you see these terms today and, and tomorrow and for the next week or so, and then certainly moving ahead when, when we start looking at specific organs, uh, just break it down, is it, one layer or many layers. And if, when you think about it, uh, you wanna consider what is the function of the organ. Uh, when we look at, at the skin, one of the main functions of skin is protection. So with the epithelium of the skin, okay, the epidermal layers, are we gonna have simple squamous, just one, thin layer of cells that are really flat? Or would it be better to have maybe uh, something that looks uh, more like this? Many, many layers uh, of flat cells that lead maybe to some cubes. This looks like it'd provide me with more protection. So, so we'd see uh, certainly uh, a, a stratified situation. Okay. All right. All right, not sure what that was. So anyhow, simple squamous, stratified squamous. So where would I maybe see simple squamous? I might find that where I need gas exchange to occur. Uh, so I, I don't need protection necessarily, uh, but I do need fast uh, diffusion of gases. So we may see simple squamous uh, in the lungs, in the alveoli, particularly of the air sacs of the lungs. Stratified squamous, again, we'd maybe see uh, more with uh, the skin or the epidermis. So anyhow, we'll look at some of these in a little more detail uh, coming up and then certainly on Thursday. I also wanted to point out, you can see this dark line across the bottom of all of these. That's that basement membrane I mentioned a few minutes ago. Again, the basement membrane is what's gonna connect the epi epithelium uh, with the connective tissue. Okay? Epithelium and connective tissue. And again, epithelium just simply means epithelial tissue, which simply means a lining or a covering, okay? So anyhow, we can have simple squamous, stratified squamous, simple cuboidal, stratified cuboidal, simple columnar. We even do see stratified columnar from time to time. And then we, we do see this pseudo stratified columnar, which is, uh, it looks like many layers. Pseudo means appears like, uh, or appears to be, but isn't. So um, kind of like fake, uh, a pseudo stratified. Pseudo means it's fake stratified or uh, appears to be stratified, but isn't. Okay, so, so we do just have one layer uh, here, even though it does look like we have multiple layers. So anyhow, pseudo stratified uh, columnar. We also see, and we typically will only see this with pseudostratified columnar, and that's the presence of these cilia. We saw last week when we talked a little bit about cellular uh, extensions and cytoskeletal aspects, maybe around the cell membrane, uh, we looked at cilia, these tiny little hair follicles. So we can see ciliated 
epithelium just means that uh, we're going to see little hairs. And what the cilia help with a lot of times is uh, uh, capturing particles or debris. So we would see cilia where we would need to trap uh, airborne particles. So typically the nasal cavities and even down into the lower respiratory tract, we would find the presence of cilia. Okay, and then lastly on this slide, we see this term transitional. Transition means it changes. Uh, so transition, uh, we go from something that's pretty thick uh, to something that's a little bit thinner. So this is the same organ, the same tissue, even the same cells in the exact same spot. However, what we see is the arrangement being thicker versus thinner. And this would be uh, the lining of the urinary bladder, for instance. The lining of the urinary bladder, when the bladder is empty, is going to be more relaxed. So we'd see the wall of the bladder being a lot thicker when there isn't anything in the bladder. It's kind of like an empty uh, balloon. You know, if you've got like a, a if you've got a red balloon or something. Uh, if it's not blown up, the rubber is really thick of that balloon. And, and it's, if it's red, it's a real deep red. Um, I've even seen, uh, we've got kids, you know, there's balloons always, and whether it's a birthday or not. Um, but uh, we've got a, uh, or I've seen in some of their multi-packs, it looks like a black balloon. You blow it up and it's, it's a bright purple. So uh, that when it's uh, relax, when the balloons relax, it's like your bladder, the, the layers are a lot thicker, uh, more dense. When we uh, stretch the balloon or stretch the bladder out, the layers are a lot more thin. So anyhow, we, it's still the same balloon. It's still the same cells. It's still the same urinary bladder. It's now uh, considered to be uh, just stretched out. Um, or relax. So we call that a transition or transitional uh, epithelium. Oh, the other thing real quick I wanted to mention, sometimes we'll see what are called goblet cells. Uh, you can kind of see in the lower left part of the screen, the word goblet, G-O-B-L-E-T, and it pops up again here in just a second. But goblet, uh, those are like little vessels or little containers. Typically, we would see some sort of a mucus uh, in a goblet cell, and they're going to secrete mucus usually out to the membrane. So uh, stratified columnar, again, we do see that. I don't have stratified columnar uh, here. I do have pseudo-stratified columnar. Stratified columnar would be multiple layers of columns. Um, you find these uh, in the urethra of the male uh, near the anus, as well as there are a couple of uh, the... Um, I want to say the retinas uh, of the eyes uh, are also uh, stratified uh, columnar uh, epithelium. So just a few spots in the body. We don't see it that often. And then transitional, I just mentioned. Okay, so simple again, we can have a simple squamous, one flat layer. It's, uh, we see that for permeable, uh, permeability. We want to move gases rapidly. S simple cuboidal, one layer of cubes. We see this oftentimes in glands as well as ducts. Okay, simple cuboidal, one layer of cubes. Okay, one layer of cubes. Okay, we've got simple squamous. We can see these real, uh, by the way, when we're looking at tissue slides, again, we're looking at, at multiple cells. And the way cells stain is the nucleus is going to be the darkest part of the cell typically. So wherever you see kind of a dark circle, uh, like here's a dark circle, here's a dark circle, there's a bunch of them in here. That's going to, the, the chromosomes stain purple, so they're of dark violet. So you're going to see uh, that these are individual uh, cells or uh, the nuclei specifically of the cells. Maybe uh, oftentimes the nucleus takes up a majority of the, the cell. You can see we've got a lot of different cells here. But then when we look at this, we can see kind of a little uh, nucleus there and another one there, there, and so on. They look pretty flat, and it looks to be only one layer. So that's where they get that simple squamous. 
epithelium. And, we, and again, we see this in the lungs oftentimes. Okay, and now we look at simple cuboidal. Again, we've got, uh, these are gonna be some, these are tubes of some sort that have been cut uh, open. So it's like if I've got a pen or a pencil and I look uh, down the, the through the, the uh, inside, I take like a cross section. I could cut this and then turn it so you can look inside. That's what we're kind of we're looking at here uh, are several tubes that have been cut uh, or a cross section has been done. And then we can see, first of all, this dark line that's differentiating all of these groups of cells. That's that basement membrane. And then again, we can see these little purple uh, circles throughout. Those are going to be nuclei. And then these appear to be kind of cube shaped. I wouldn't say they're flat, nor would I say they're columns. So we would say these are cubes. And again, we only see one uh, layer. So we'd call those simple cuboidal. All right. The other term that we see on here is lumen, L-U-M-E-N. Lumen is simply that opening uh, of the tube or the kind of the negative space inside. It's the inside of a tube called the lumen. That's where whatever substance is uh, within the tube, that's where it's, it's traveling through the lumen. Okay, simple columnar, one layer of tall column-shaped uh, cells. Uh, again, oftentimes we'll see uh, goblet cells that secrete mucus. Uh, we'll see cilia that help with movement or, or with, with movement of, of uh, particles. So if we've got particulate passing through a lumen or a tube, cilia can help move those particulates or, or even trap those particles and then move them out of an area. And then microvilli, uh, we'll see uh, it when we get to uh, the digestive system and uh, start talking about uh, absorption of nutrients. And again, uh, usually we'd see that with a hollow a visceral. So there's that term visceral meaning guts. All right, and then pseudostratified uh, columnar epithelium. Again, one layer of columns, but they're oddball shaped. Uh, so we have differing heights. They, we don't have consistency in the heights. Um, they all uh, connect to the, to the basement membrane. Each cell connects to the basement membrane. That's what makes it simple. But uh, instead of simple columnar, because we already have simple columnar, uh, we uh, call it pseudostratified because, again, we have differing heights, differing uh, kind of shapes of the cells. Whereas simple columnar, still one layer of columns, they're going to be consistent heights and shapes. We'd find pseudostratified uh, typically in the air passages, uh, so the nasal passages, uh, the sinuses. Um, and again, typically we would see cilia and mucus with pseudostratified uh, columnar and therefore goblet cells. Uh, here's some simple columnar uh, epithelium. Again, we see some column shaped cells. They're very long. And notice they're all, the nuclei of all of these are pretty much parallel. So we can say that uh, they're all just about the same height. We don't see nuclei anywhere else. So these are simple columnar uh, epithelial uh, cells. And then embedded down in here, we see what's called a goblet cell. And this is gonna be a, a mucus producing and releasing cell. So this might be the lumen and we might be spritzing here. Um, okay. We've got the basement membrane and then some sort of a duct, and then we might be spritzing whatever is uh, being produced in the goblet cells okay. into the lumen. All right, then we've got pseudostratified uh, columnar. So again, these are column shaped, but notice the nuclei are, are a little bit disorganized. We see some down at the bottom. They kind of connect. One of the main features we see typically with pseudostratified epithelium is going to be the presence of cilia 
and goblet cells. So we can see these goblet cells um, secreting mucus. They're going to secrete that mucus out here. This would be the lumen up here at the top. This is where air would be passing through. And so that air is going to be uh, full of dust particles and, and other items. And so these cilia, which are a little bit sticky because of the presence of mucus from the goblet cells, is going to kind of trap and pick up those, those airborne particulates and move them uh, out uh, of the uh, uh, respiratory tract. And again, we see this kind of dark dividing line at the bottom. That's that basement membrane. And then what would this be down here? This would be some form of connective tissue, right? Epithelium, most superficial, connective uh, deep to that epithelium. Okay. Okay, stratified uh, squamous, stratified cuboidal. I don't know why cuboidals first. Well, we'll just do cuboidal first. Stratified cuboidal, so many layers of cubes. Uh, a basement membrane is oftentimes difficult to see in stratified cuboidal. We typically find these in the pharynx, which is kind of like the back of the mouth and back of the throat area, uh, heading down toward the voice box. And then we'd also see uh, these. Uh, so that's, a, that's an area where moisture is important. Hydration is important. Uh, so... Uh, so anyway, we also need uh, some protection. It's a high traffic area in the pharynx. It's where food and beverage uh, that we've just, especially food, right? So a bag of Doritos, you're not chewing them the way you should and you swallow one, it's got a little sharp edge and it kind of gouges you back there uh, in the pharynx uh, region. Um, well, we've got stratified cuboidal, so it's multi-layered. Uh, it's cube-shaped, so we're probably getting some mucus as well uh, uh, coming from there. So we've got some good protection. You're going to repair that spot. It's probably not going to cause any bleeding or anything, and depending how sharp and, and that it went, you might feel it a little bit more as pressure than anything else. And then certainly in sweat glands, we might see that stratified cuboidal. Uh, we also have stratified squamous. This is uh, uh, what we're going to deal with uh, when we talk about the epidermis of the skin. We see, again, stratified squamous, many layers of flat squamous cells. We also see this term keratinized, and keratinized simply means that they have hardened. So we've got a, a hardening layer or a keratinized layer of these particular stratified squamous cells. Okay, so if we have keratinized as another, another modifier or keratinized as another adjective, that means we must have non-keratinized, otherwise we wouldn't have it there. So we do see stratified squamous epithelium in other places than just the, the skin, the epidermis of the skin. We see this uh, internally as well uh, as non-keratinized uh, uh, stratified squamous epithelium. Uh, the vaginal canal, the mouth, the esophagus are going to be spots where we would see uh, uh, the cervix as well. Non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So again, many layers of flat cells. However, that outermost layer of, of cells is not hardened, or at least shouldn't be hardened. Okay? We need that to be more, um, more hydrated, and uh, we need these cells to, to not be hardened. So um, a pap smear is done to see if the uh, cervical uh, stratified squamous epithelial cells uh, are non-keratinized. They should be. If they've become keratinized, that could be a sign of, of a hypermitotic event. Too much mitosis, too many cells uh, could be a, a, an indicator of uh, cervical cancer. And again, primary function is protection, just like this one. Okay, so stratified squamous, protection. Keratinized, hardened, so the skin for protection. Uh, Non-keratinized, 
uh, more moist or lubricated or hydrated, still providing protection, but again, more internally and more of, more of, of uh, for lubricative uh, purposes, especially for swallowing food. Um, again, that, that, uh, that, that uh, bag of Doritos, uh, it helps to have membranes uh, in the mouth and esophagus that already uh, have some sort of, of hydration uh, or moisture. So anyway, transitional epithelium, we looked at with the, the urinary bladder, uh, stratified uh, epithelium that gets even more stratified uh, when it's uh, empty, less stratified uh, when it's distended uh, or full. So that's all the membranous uh, um, epithelium. We had the glandular epithelium as well. Uh, we have what are called exocrine and endocrine glands. We spend an entire uh, chapter talking about the endocrine system, so I'm not going to spend a heck of a lot of time on the endocrine glands. They are considered to be ductless, uh, and they discharge uh, their fluid, which is a hormone typically, directly into the bloodstream. So endo, meaning inside, Okay, into the bloodstream. So endocrine, we're secreting directly inside. Uh, exo, we're going to exit the gland uh, into a duct. And then that, that will, the duct will then lead uh, to wherever uh, we're trying to get that, um, that uh, chemical to go. Okay, so exocrine, we're going to talk about those for just a couple of minutes. Uh, we have what are called tubular uh, and alveolar uh, glands that are classified mainly on the structure uh, of those ducts and, 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 and how complex the duct system is. So again, we're going to see simple, uh, but not squamous, we're going to see simple and compound this time. So simple, uh, one duct leads to the surface. Compound, we're going to have multiple ducts uh, leading to the surface. So we'd see a simple tubular gland, uh, for instance, uh, in the gastric uh, area or the stomach area. So these are like gastric pits, uh, and they may be secreting uh, some sort of, of uh, digestive enzyme or a hydrochloric acid or something along those lines. So we're going to see just a tubular. Uh, gland, and then we have uh, um, a simple tubular, but it's got, notice this one has branches, but it's still going to be simple because it has one exit. Okay, so both of these are simple because there's one exit. Okay, one's tubular, simple, one's branched, tubular, still simple. Okay, um, we're going to uh, focus on a couple of uh, other types of uh, exocrine glands that we're going to see uh, with the skin oftentimes, and those are uh, apocrine glands, apocrine, we see apo means apex of the cell. So apocrine glands uh, generally uh, have kind of like an apex or a, a point, and we're going to see that that uh, whatever they secrete is going to kind of collect near that apex, and then uh, the secretion may get pinched off of that uh, that distended end, so which could cause damage to the cell membrane. Okay, so we see the apocrine glands. So we can see the apex of the top of the cell kind of pinches off. So that, that could uh, be detrimental. We see a we generally see apocrine glands on the top of the head uh, and in the armpits and groin area. Okay. Apocrine. Holocrine, okay. apocrine, holocrine uh, glands, uh, secretion of products causes rupture and death of the cell. Um, we could we see uh, sebaceous glands or oil glands uh, or holocrine uh, glands. Sebum is the product that they secrete. Sebum 
is, uh, goes with sebaceous glands. And this is a type of oil. And our hair follicles uh, are all going to be uh, uh, linked with and connected with uh, holocrine uh, glands uh, secreting oil or sebum. Okay. Um, Miracrine uh, glands, these are the most numerous. Um, these are just going to secrete their product directly into, uh, directly through their cell membrane, directly into the duct. So these don't uh, uh, allow for any damage. We could see this is more like that exocytosis that we looked at, where you'd maybe have some sort of a lysosome or something that's going to attach to the cell membrane, and then we're going to uh, kind of shoot out or spit out uh, the item. Holocrine, it's the basically, yeah, the cell gets pushed. So, that, so, so baby cells are born down by the basement membrane. So this is what, so we see this single layer, simple uh, cuboidal type of epithelium, but we see another one here, another one here, and another one here. These are kind of another cell. So basically this one the, is newer. The one closer to the basement membrane is a newborn cell. And what it does is basically pushes then or triggers the the uh, the cell it's pushing out uh, to to go ahead and and uh, disband or break off and then uh, as it does it's going to break open its plasma membrane and then release uh, whatever uh, so this would be oil like this could be a, an oil gland so the oils of your hair we don't just secrete a bunch of oil all the time. We have specific, these, the, the holocrine cells actually break off, and when they break off, the oil comes from the glands. So folks who have really oily uh, hair may have hyperactive uh, holocrine glands. So the mitotic aspects go faster, and uh, they're a little more oilier because they're, they're releasing more of their cells uh, that release the oil. So folks who are really dry, kind of the opposite. They may have kind of a slower uh, uh, lifespan of these holocrine glands. Uh, they may not have as much oil in them. Uh, we may not have, and, and each hair follicle usually has multiple sebaceous glands, so it could be a numbers game uh, too, where they just don't, uh, their hair, the drier hair doesn't have as many uh, sebaceous glands. All right, so that's it for epithelial. Uh, we're going to zip through connective uh, and, and um, uh, muscle and nerve so we can get into uh, to skin a little bit. Um, connective tissues, oftentimes abbreviated CT. Epithelial tissue can be abbreviated ET as well. Uh, but CT, we oftentimes think of as being the abbreviation for connective tissue. And certainly uh, the primary function is in the name, connective tissue connects or links. What is it linking? Well, it's linking or connecting uh, epithelial uh, tissue with uh, whatever is underneath. It could probably more connective tissue um, or some sort of um, muscle tissue or fascia that lines or covers a muscle tissue. So generally, connective tissue is the connector uh, uh, of the uh, deepest uh, aspects uh, of our organs or our tissues with the most superficial aspects. Okay? That's why it's called connective. So it connects, it supports, we see transportation. Uh, there's certainly another level of protection uh, past the uh, epithelial uh, layers. The predominant uh, structure is gonna be, uh, that we see is gonna be that um, extracellular matrix we discussed uh, a little bit earlier. And again, that extracellular matrix is a fluid kind of gelatinous uh, with a lot of uh, a matrix. It can be a solid matrix. And typically, again, we're going to see some sort of extracellular compounds in that matrix. So always connect matrix with connective tissue. Link, connect, connect with connective, whatever. Link uh, connective tissue with matrix. Cells in a matrix. That's the definition of connective tissue. Cells in a matrix. Okay. Um, we have a couple different types, four main types of connective tissue. We have what's called fibrous connective tissue, what's also known as connective tissue proper. 
This is, uh, we see loose fibrous or also known as areolar connective tissue, what we call adipose. You've heard this as, as fat uh, at some point, uh, reticular connective tissue, and then we have what's called dense. So we have loose and then dense. The, the loose, dense, and then these two in between, that has to do with the amount of fibers uh, within uh, the cells okay, or within the tissue, within the matrix of the, of the tissue. Okay, so how, how much um, fiber is in the matrix? If there's a lot of fiber in the matrix, we call it dense. If there's not much fiber in the matrix, we call it loose. Okay, so when we look on Thursday at, at some microscope slides of these, we're going to see, uh, they'll be fairly easy to identify based simply on the amount of fibers that we see. All right, uh, and the adipose is similar to loose. We're not going to see much of any uh, fibers. Reticular, we're going to see quite a bit of fibers, uh, more than we do with loose, but not quite as many as we'd maybe see with dense. So reticular is kind of like the middle ground. Um, when we get to dense, we can either see the arrangement of the, all of those fibers as being irregular, meaning they're scattered all over the place, uh, or regular, meaning that uh, they're in kind of a parallel arrangement. They're organized. So we see dense, regular connective tissue. Uh, it's going to have collagen and elastic. We'd see this oftentimes with like ligaments. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll, we'll, oops, we'll look at um, examples of fibrous connective tissue uh, coming up. And then the other three types of connective tissue are bone, cartilage, and blood. Okay, bone is a connective tissue, cells in a matrix. We have a couple type, different types of bone, compact and spongy or cancellous bone. We're, we're, you're going to get a little bit uh, today, not much, a little bit on Thursday, not much on bone, simply because next week we start doing the skeletal system. So we'll look at bone in quite a bit more detail over the next uh, week or two. But I'll introduce you to a little bit of the tissue aspect. So bone is a connective tissue. Okay. Uh, um, cartilage is a type of connective tissue. We're going to see three different types of cartilage, hyaline cartilage, fibrocartilage, and elastic cartilage. Some say hyaline, some say hyaline. Just like endocrine and endocrine, you'll hear both. Okay, so um, fibrous connective tissue, bone, cartilage, and lastly, blood. Blood is a connective tissue, cells in a matrix. Okay, so we'll look at blood again, probably about week 11 or 12, uh, maybe week 10. So we're not going to spend a heck of a lot of time on blood, um, these units. There's a lot of info, isn't it? I know. Just remember, we've got four, we've got four tissue types. We've got epithelial, connective, uh, muscular, and nervous tissue. Epithelium is a lining or covering, and we went through a, a few different examples. Now we're on to connective tissue, um, which connects epithelium to, to other uh, tissues uh, deeper in the body. And now we're going to go through just a couple different types of, of these uh, connective tissue types. So first up is the fibrous connective tissue. Again, I don't want to spend a heck of a lot of time on these because we do go back through them on Thursday. Um, so four types of fibrous connective tissue. Again, they're generally termed based on um, uh, the fiber amount and then fiber arrangement, fibers in the matrix. So loose just means we don't have a lot of, of fibers in the matrix. Stretchy, flexibility, um, fibroblasts, macrophages, mast cells, plasma cells, fat cells, so uh, we do see quite a few different types of 
of fibers in the matrix uh, of uh, five of this loose uh, fibrous connective tissue. So it's saying that this is just telling us what types of cells uh, we oftentimes see uh, contained within loose connective tissue. So we can see a lot of uh, kind of uh, what we would consider to be kind of negative space. We can see a lot of matrix with this. I don't see a lot of cells here. Here's a couple, here's some mast cells, probably a red blood cell somewhere around here floating around, maybe right there, right here. Hey. Got a capillary with some, uh, there's a white blood cell in the capillary. And then we've got all these little strands and strings of fibers, elastic, collagen. So this is what they consider to be loose connective tissue. We might see this, uh, or areolar connective tissue. We might see this in the uh, dermis of the skin in some areas. Okay, so loose fibrous. We got a blood vessel, we got some macrophage activity, mast cells. Okay. And the second type uh, is adipose tissue. Again, we'd primarily find uh, adipocytes or fat cells with adipose uh, tissues. And then we might see some fibroblasts. Fibroblasts are just cells, the newborn fiber cells. So what's gonna be a new strand of collagen or a new strand of elastin potentially. Fibroblasts are baby fiber cells. Okay. Adipose is, is a energy uh, containers basically. We can see the plasma membranes around each of these uh, adipocytes or adipose cells. There's a nucleus of one. And again, it's a storage area for fat. Not a lot of matrix really with uh, adipose tissue. It's primarily made of adipocytes or fat cells. Remember, connective tissue is cells in a matrix. We had loose connective tissue just a couple of cells in the matrix. Adipose tissue is primarily cells and very little matrix. Okay. Different types of fats. The, the uh, body fat that most of us think of is what they call white fat. And then we do have some brown fat uh, in other areas uh, of the body. For, with, uh, that are going to have some energy storage and play some other roles that we'll see uh, more next semester. Okay, and then reticular uh, tissue, we, we're going to see a lot of uh, this with blood. So we'll usually uh, recognize blood cells uh, within reticular tissue. So bone marrow, lymph nodes, and the spleen. It's going to be a lot of branching fibers and, and uh uh, again, usually so you'll see some red blood cells. That's what all of these little red circles uh, are, are going to be red blood cells. And then we might see some, uh, some bigger ones, uh, maybe like a darker purple, like this might be a, a white blood cell clump. Okay. But yeah, you can see there's some, some little red blood cells and then a, a lot of fibers. Again, it's, it's more dense than loose, but not as dense as, as this, what we see with dense connective tissue. Okay, with dense connective tissue, uh, the matrix uh, is primarily uh, uh, gonna be fibers. Dense uh, means a lot of fibers, okay? So again, on Thursday, we're gonna be putting a lot of this together. So, uh, so again, I go back through and, and uh, or start looking at Thursday, you'll be able to make some links with exactly what we're doing right in through this, uh, this area of the slideshow. Okay, so if those fibers that are densely packed are arranged irregularly, uh, so really there isn't an arrangement, then uh, we say they're irregular, dense, uh, fibrous connective tissue. Then we also have regular uh, meaning we have a pattern or there's a parallel arrangement uh, or rows. 
collagenous is mostly collagen in the extracellular matrix, and then elastic is mostly elastic fibers. So we see dense, irregular, so there's not really a parallel arrangement. And then if we look at this, we can see there's a nice, uh, there's a lot of fibers, so it's very dense. And then we can see they're arranged in parallel groupings or bundles. We oftentimes would consider tendons and ligaments to be that dense, regular uh, connective tissue. Uh, it provides a lot of support, a lot of strength, a lot of durability. Uh, we see certainly some elasticity uh, with, the, with these fibers, uh, the tendons. By the way, I take it for granted sometimes, you guys all know what a tendon and a ligament are. <clears throat> a tendon attaches a muscle, a skeletal muscle, to a bone. Okay, so a muscle to a bone is a tendon. A ligament connects a bone to another bone. Okay, so a ligament connects bone with bone. So ligaments provide a lot of, of support for the joint. Tendons help with movement across the joint. Okay, here's some dense regular with uh, elastic fibers versus collagen fibers. And I wouldn't necessarily expect any of you to know the difference or recognize the difference. Uh, in these. What I do need you to know is that elastic fibers provide elasticity or flexibility. Okay? Collagen fibers provide more strength and durability. So that's mainly what you're going to want to know. Okay, so trucking forward, uh, moving out of the fibrous connective tissue into bone. Again, I'm not going to spend much time on bone today because next week and the week after will be more bone stuff. Um, we do see what are called osteocytes. So again, cells in a matrix, right? We're on connective tissue. So cells in a matrix, the cells that we, we see with bone are called osteocytes. Well, one type of cell osteocytes and the matrix is calcified so uh, it's, the matrix is kind of hardened so um, cells in a matrix osteocytes in a calcified matrix and that matrix is is, is about two-thirds of bone okay so that calcified inorganic bone matrix it's calci calcified, um, there's going to be phosphorus as well. Those are the two main minerals we'd find in bone. Uh, so two-thirds of bone is going to be hard and inorganic, uh, composed of inorganic matrix. Again, we'll do this next week and the week after. Functions of bone, support, protect, attachment for muscles, mineral storage, and blood-forming tissues. So we'll look at the, the canals of the bones next week. We can see we've got spongy bone called cancellous, and then we have thicker bone called compact. It's more dense or compactly uh, arranged. Here's a bone cell, or here's a bone tissue. You can see bone cells or osteocytes. And these little dark purple, and then all of this negative space, all this white, and then some of this uh, purple, uh, these little lines, the real light lines, that's all calcium uh, and matrix with some phosphorus. We do have small uh, canals. You can see canaliculi. These little lines are canals uh, that potentially are delivering nutrients, minerals, um, um, yeah oxygen, blood supply. Okay, so that's what these Haversian canals are going to have blood vessels. And then nutrients are going to get dropped off and then they can uh, be passed to these cells via these canaliculi or small canals. Again, I don't want to spend uh, too much time uh, on bone or cartilage. Okay, so bone tissue, cells in a matrix, osteocytes in a calcified inorganic matrix. Cartilage is next. Uh, we call them chondrocytes instead of osteocytes. Um, okay. 
They're the only cells present in cartilage. And um, these cells produce fibers uh, as well as the ground substance of the cartilage. Um, the thing about cartilage is it's, it has no blood supply. It's avascular. It's, it's basic. It's, it's very compartmentalized. Um, nutrition occurs through the diffusion of nutrients uh, from surrounding uh, cells and, and from the matrix. So these cartilage cells or these chondrocytes are floating around and, and suspended in a kind of a gelatinous matrix. And so the matrix gets fed from surrounding areas and then nutrients pass uh, from the matrix into these cells. So chondrocytes eat uh, that way. There's a, there's a, just like we have with bone, there's a sheath that surrounds bone. We have another sheath that we look at that does surround cartilage. We see three different types of cartilage. Uh, hyaline cartilage or hyaline cartilage is the shiniest, most translucent, uh, the most prevalent uh, type of cartilage we find in the body. We're going to see it next week when we do bones. This is what we find at the end of bone. Cartilage is oftentimes represented in our books or in our illustrations uh, with light blue. Cartilage is light blue in color when, they, when we see illustrations. Uh, again, that kind of represents uh, no blood supply or avascular, the avascular nature of cartilage. So anyway, hyaline or hyaline cartilage found at the end of bones, so it does provide a good cushion. Okay, so we do see, notice a lot, these are the chondrocytes, and in between the chondrocytes, we can see the matrix. Okay, and these are nice and cushiony. These form a really good cushion. Shiny and translucent. Then we have fibrocartilage. So we see the term fibro uh, in there. Fibrocartilage is, is the most durable. Um, it has fibers in it uh, to provide extra durability. Uh, we typically find fibrocartilage with the inner vertebral discs. Uh, of the vertebral column, as well as when we'll see this again next week and the week after with bones, we find it in between the pubic bones, where the pubis bones or pubic bones attach uh, is called a pubic symphysis, and that's a cartilaginous disc uh, made of fibrocartilage. And then, of course, uh, in between each vertebra is an intervertebral disc. Uh, herniated discs are uh, related to uh, the fibrocartilage and a couple different features we'll look at again next week and the week after when we get to the skeletal system. And we have what are called menisci. These are little donuts uh, it, uh, kind of encased at the end of our uh, femur, the distal part of the femur and the proximal part of the tibia. At the knee joint, we have a couple little extra cartilaginous pads uh, called menisci. They, they provide a little extra strength uh, and support. Okay. The knee has a lot of cartilage, right? The hyaline cartilage is going to be coating the ends of the bones. And then the menisci or the fibrocartilage discs are going to be in between uh, the bones. So, there's a, so either way, there's a lot of cushion and support down there uh, in the knees. Okay, and then lastly is elastic cartilage. So elastic implies there's more elastin. It implies we're going to have flexibility. Uh, so again, we're going to see um, uh, some some small uh, fibers, elastic fibers uh, contained throughout. Um, a lot less density, maybe, than what we see with the fibrocartilage, and certainly uh, more dense than we see uh, with hyaline. So hyaline is the glassiest, most uh, kind of opalescent look to it. It's the most uh, um, related to bone. It even kind of looks similar to, to baby bone cells, actually. Fibrocartilage, again, more uh, cartilage cells. Again, they look similar to bone cells, but they're softer. Cartilage cells and their uh, fibrocartilage, lots of fiber. And then elastic. Uh, uh, cartilage is going to have elastic fibers, so we're going to see more flexibility uh, with elastic uh, cartilage.
Okay, blood is the last type of connective tissue. Uh, again, not going to spend much time on it. Uh, cells in a matrix, right? That's been the common theme with connective tissue. Uh, the matrix for blood is called plasma. And then the cells are going to be red blood cells, white blood cells, uh, and platelets. So when we look at blood, we can see all of these red blood cells. That's the majority of the cellular portion. And then again, all that negative space, uh, that white area is going to be uh, where we find plasma. So that's plasma is about 55% of the blood and then red blood cells are roughly 45%. So nearly 100% of your blood is, is about a 50-50 red blood cell pl uh, plasma ratio. It's 55-45 plasma to red blood cell. But we do have some white blood cells. They stain a kind of a purplish color. They're a little more, uh, they're generally, uh, the same to larger than red blood cells. You can see this one's similar in size, whereas this one's bigger. We also, again, see a, a pretty evident nucleus. Remember, nucleus is gonna stain purple. Red blood cells do not possess a nucleus, so they're not gonna stain with that purple uh, in the center. They look almost hollow in the center. So when you guys were doing cells last week, remember red blood cells are, are one of the main oddballs regarding no nucleus. And we can see that in full form here because that dye attaches to the nucleus of cells. And that's why we get this deep purple going on with the, red or with the white blood cells. No purple going on with the red blood cells or no deep violet, I think is what they call it. And then we also see little specks that are darker. Those are gonna be platelets. You have a lot of platelets, but they're, they're so tiny, they don't really take up much of the blood. So the composition of blood really doesn't include a lot of, of, uh, of bulk regarding white blood cells and platelets. Why do you need blood? Uh, transportation of nutrients, elimination of waste, gases, all kinds of good stuff. So we spend a lot of time on blood. I don't want to spend much uh, any more time on it, really. I just want to touch on muscles a little bit, uh, nerve tissue a little bit, and then uh, we'll take a few minutes. We'll take a little break, and then uh, I just want to talk briefly about the skin. So um, muscle tissue type. So, so we're on tissue type number three. First tissue type we did was epithelial tissue. And we saw we can uh, arrange and, and categorize epithelial tissue based on uh, cell shape, whether they're flat, cubes, or columns, as well as uh, the, the layers or the, um, the numbers of layers of those cells. Okay. Epithelial, linings and coverings. Second, we did connective tissue. We had fibrous connective tissue. Uh, we had bone, we had cartilage, and we had blood. And then under each one, we had a couple examples. And again, we're gonna go through all this again and uh, with Visible Body on Thursday, or, or you guys will. Uh, well, we will. I'll be there and, and guide you and introduce you to it, and then you can uh, take off for, uh, running from there. Um, so tissue type three is muscle. We see three muscle uh, types. Okay? We see skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscle uh, tissue types. And how we generally categorize these muscle types is going to be based on whether or not we have what are called striations or stripes, uh, and whether or not we have control over the muscle. So you see with skeletal, it says striated voluntary. So that means we see stripes in the muscle uh, tissue and it is under control uh, by voluntary control. So the nervous system uh, and you tell the muscle what to do. That's skeletal. Of course, we know that would be attached to the skeleton, right? Skeletal system, okay? Skeletal muscle bones. Okay? So these are the muscles of movement. In fact, generally, when you guys think, have heard the word muscle up until this point, or up until you took an anatomy class, muscle probably meant muscle, like skeletal muscle. And then maybe you learn that the heart is a muscle as well. So we call that cardiac muscle. We'll talk about that in just a second. 
And then uh, the second type is smooth. And with smooth muscle, we see no striations. That's why it's called smooth. And then it's under involuntary or visceral control. So involuntary control, these are your visceral uh, muscles. So your guts. Uh, all of your organs are made up of smooth muscle. We'll also see these tubes uh, like blood vessels are going to have smooth muscle involved. So like a blood vessel is going to be lined with epithelium, you know, a little layer of connective tissue, and then it's going to have some smooth muscle uh, layers as well. And, and then we'll see nerve tissue uh, involved with all of this. Nerve kind of goes with everything. That's why we do that one last. A okay, smooth, non-striated and involuntary. And then lastly, the cardiac or the heart muscle cells uh, or muscle tissue is going to be striated. So it looks similar to skeletal muscle, but it's going to be involuntary, meaning it beats uh, on its own. We don't have to tell it to. And when we look at skeletal muscle, again, we can see the striations. And we'll, we'll, in a couple of weeks, when we get to muscles and then next semester, we spend a couple of weeks on muscle physiology, we'll look at what, what are all these stripes. Um, we don't need to worry about uh, A lines and Z discs and I bands and uh, any of that right now. Okay, we'll get into that later. Um, actually, in a, in a couple of weeks, we'll introduce you to some of what this striation stuff is. In fact, when we do the muscle chapter, what we're really talking about is skeletal muscles. So keep that in mind too. When we get to, and I'll re remind you, when we get to the muscle chapter, it doesn't cover muscle tissue, all three. It generally is uh, focused on skeletal muscle. So anyway, uh, smooth muscle, again, we can see the, the nuclei of smooth muscle, no striations going on here. We do have some fibrous uh, aspects going on though to, to help with uh, some of the structural aspects. Smooth muscle, again, is, is uh, th throughout the cardiovascular system, all of these blood vessels. We see some smooth muscle in, in a few spots within the heart. Generally, we think of the heart, those being, being cardiac muscle. And we also find smooth muscle in, in all of your viscera, your guts, your, your esophagus, your trachea, your stomach, uh, your urinary bladder. Okay. Small intestines, large intestines, that's all smooth muscle. Uh, or contain smooth muscle. And again, cardiac is the heart muscle. We see these little discs called intercalated discs. That's a slight difference in what we, we generally would see uh, with, uh, from any other uh, of these muscles. So intercalated discs. But you do see striations. So we, see we have striated, but it is involuntarily controlled. And again, microscopic characteristics, thread-like with, with striations, no striations. Uh, oh, and this is interesting too. Skeletal cells are multi-nucleated, uh, many nuclei per cell, whereas smooth muscle cells, one nucleus per cell. And that's it for muscles. Last tissue is nervous tissue. Again, I'm going to spend about 30 seconds on nervous tissue. Um, it's, it has excitability. We can conduct uh, electricity uh, along it. That's what creates the excitability aspects. Uh, the organs of the nervous tissue are the brain, spinal cord, and nerves. And nervous tissue is, is mainly composed of two types of cells. We have what are called neurons. That's the conducting aspect. We're going to see a cell body, an axon, and a dendrite. And then neuroglia, which is the nerve glue. It's kind of like the matrix or the, outs, so the stuff out around the cell or outside of the cell. So all this white is the matrix or the, the nerve glue. And by the way, too, when a, when a transmission travels, uh, it comes to an, a neuron, we're going to see that it comes in through the dendrites. So the first stop is the dendrites. And then the second stop is the cell body of the neuron. And then it's going to travel down the axon to what we call the axon terminal. So these are probably all dendrites here. So, so if this 
neurons trying to communicate with this one, which is trying to communicate. So maybe this one's trying to communicate with this one. But as a pass through this one, this neuron here is going to send a signal down uh, its uh, axon. So this might be its axon here. So a signal is going to leave the axon. It's going to connect with the dendrite of this neuron. And then that stimulus or that transmission of electricity is going to go from then the dendrite first into the cell body, down the axon to what we call the axon terminal, the end of the axon. And that's going to connect with dendrites of another uh, neuron and so on. So um, dendrites, cell body, axon, axon terminal. Is, is the order. And there are a few other features that we'll see and look at in the future. Um, integumentary system, let me see, let me check something real quick. Ba -ba -ba, da -da -da. 30, wow, we've been cruising. Um, let, let me just finish a couple of things here. Integumentary system. I'll tell you what, I need a break. So I am going to take a break. I'm going to come back uh, at about one, in about 10, 15 minutes at 1.45. I'll start back up and we will, we'll get through skin. There's probably about 25, slides at the most but there's there are a couple of uh, we're going to stay on a couple of slides for the most most of that time but um i need to use the restroom and uh rest my voice for about 10 or 15 minutes so come back uh, my computer says 131 uh, i don't know what time it really is i'm going to come back and start back up at 145 uh, on my computer so um, i'm going to pause uh, the recording I'm going to resume recording. Okay, uh, chapter five on the integumentary system. There we go. Okay, so generally we think of the skin as being the primary organ of the integumentary system. Um, the hair and the nails are also included. We're going to spend our time primarily, and, and WIDS primarily wants us to spend our time on the uh, skin itself. Um, it is the body's uh, largest organ. It's not the largest internal organ, but if you're ever asked what's the largest organ of the body, it's definitely the skin. If you're ever asked the largest internal organ, you're probably thinking the liver. Uh, the skin and its appendages. And again, the appendages would be the hair and the nails. It's a cutane, the skin is our focus primarily. It's a cutaneous membrane, uh, primarily composed of the epidermis and the dermis. And I mentioned the epidermis a little bit ago. It's the epidermis is the epithelial portion. The dermis is the connective tissue portion. And then just below the dermis is where we're going to find the hypodermis. That's also going to be uh, connective tissue. It's primarily uh, adipose uh, fibrous connective tissue. Uh, we do see what's called thin skin versus thick skin. Uh, the bulk of the body is going to be thin skin. Um, thick skin, uh, we don't find hair, uh, and certainly the 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 we'll see the skin is thicker, obviously, it's called thick skin. Um, that is gonna be where we'd see maybe like the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. Um, when we look at, uh, uh, so most of the, the illustrations or diagrams we see with the skin are gonna be uh, relating to thin skin. Um, so anyway, uh, we do see the epidermis, uh, here, and then we see that keratinized uh, stratified squamous aspect uh, on the surface, and then uh, we can see that uh, dermis aspect uh, of, uh, of the connective tissue, uh, that loose areolar. And then we can see, can't you can kind of see maybe the basement membrane. Uh, if we looked, if we were to zoom in closer, we could see it but it's pretty evident where the epidermis and dermis uh, meet. 
that's going to be where the basement membrane is. They also call that the dermoepidermal junction. We'll see that again soon, the DEJ or the dermo uh, epidermal junction. Okay, so anyhow, uh, thick skin versus thin skin. So you can see the thickness of the epidermis. We can see that keratinized uh, aspect of the epidermis. We also are going to see throughout the body, whether it's thick or thin, we are going to see sweat ducts leading uh, to through pores. Okay, so we are going to have pores in the skin, certainly. And that's going to be where sweat glands are going to be uh, dumping uh, sweat um, out of the body. Okay, see the epidermis. And then one thing we notice too about the epidermis, first of all, it's extremely purple. And I know these are just uh, illustrations, but um, the purple implies, remember, that we have a lot of nuclei, right? Nuclei stain purple. So we would expect to see a lot of cells where we see a lot of purple. And so what we end up with, uh, knowing the epidermis is a lot of cells, we call them stratified squamous, we can see um, a lot of purple there. And then where that purple ends, we now know uh, we're out of the epidermis into the dermis. The other thing too about that epidermis is it's avascular, there's no vascularization, no blood supply to it um, or within it. We can feed the basement of the epidermis from the dermis via uh, these capillaries that butt right against the uh, butt up right against the basement membrane. So anyway, the epidermis is is pretty much just a bunch of cells. That's my point. The dermis has everything else. We see the connective tissue. It's loose. It's got a ton of blood vessels and nerves. Uh, we see a sweat gland uh, even disappearing a little bit down into the hypodermis, and that's usually going to be represented as yellow hypodermis is yellow and it's yellow because fat is almost always represented uh, as being yellow so especially bright yellow that's indicative in illustrations of anatomy uh, of fat nerves we're going to see have a, a coating called a myelin sheath that speeds up transmission of electricity that's made of fat that's why nerves are oftentimes indicated as being yellow because they have that lining or that covering I should say it's kind of like an insulator around a wire and that insulator called myelin m-y-e-l-i-n that's also made of fat so anyway that's what we see a lot going on in the dermis uh, as well as the hypodermis we have two types of, of connective tissue. And then with the epidermis, we have epithelial tissue um, and uh, no blood supply and a bunch of uh, cells piled on one another. We look at thin skin. This is more common throughout the body. This is where we're going to see hair follicles. So that's the main difference between this slide and this slide. This is the presence of the hair follicle as well as the thickness uh, of that epidermal layer. We can also see uh, a couple of things going on with uh, the hair follicles. We have our first muscle of the semester. Uh, they call it the erector pili. Pili means hair in Latin, like palo, it means hair in Spanish. Pili, and erector means erect or to stand on end. So one of the ways that temperature is regulated uh, certainly is to... Um, uh, get the erector pili to contract and stand the hair on end. Okay, and then the other thing we see associated with the hair follicles, in addition to that erector pili, uh, is the presence of the sebaceous glands. The sebaceous glands uh, are also known as oil glands. Okay, and these oil glands, remember, uh, being holocrine, they're going to be uh, kind of uh, the entire cell is going to release and then kind of explode. And, and uh, with uh, that explosion comes oil. So that's going to lubricate uh, the hair follicle. You can see, too, each hair follicle is going to have multiple uh, oil glands or sebaceous glands. And then we just like we saw before, we see sweat glands. 
we saw with uh, the thick skin. Not a lot of differences other than obviously the thickness of the epidermis, uh, but the presence of the hair follicles, which is going to include sebaceous glands and the erector pili muscle. Um, when we so we're going to focus on the epidermis for a few minutes. Uh, we have four different types of cells uh, in the epidermis. The primary cells are called keratin cells or keratinocytes. Probably a, close to ninety percent, maybe more, uh, are going to be keratinocytes. Um, we're going to have maybe eight to ten percent of the cells are going to be melanocytes, and that contributes to skin color and filters UV light. So 98% of your epidermis is composed of these first two, keratinocytes and melanocytes. Okay, again, keratinocytes will provide the protection. Um, and again, they're working toward being keratinized. Okay, and then the last two are what they call uh, Langerhans and Merkel cells. Langerhans cells have dendrites or little fingers coming off of them and they help with immunity. And then Merkel cells are going to help with uh, the sense of touch, particularly light touch. They also call Merkel cells tactile epithelial cells. So tactile we know has to do with touch. So when we look at a diagrammatic view of the epidermis, we first off uh, see this dermo-epidermal junction, the DEJ. This is that, that basement membrane that's going to connect the epidermis with the dermis. Now, as we travel up, uh, now and the other thing too I want to show real quick is notice the dermis uh, has this uh, nerve coming up and kind of plugging in to the DEJ and then ultimately into the epidermis. And you can see that term myelin also there, that's again that protective sheath that speeds an impulse uh, down a nerve. Okay, so now let's take a peek uh, exclusively at the epidermis and we see this lower, uh, this lower level is gonna be the, uh, the basal or the stratum basal, what they call the basement uh, not the basement layer, that's this basement membrane, but this is the base uh, layer of the epidermis. So it, when you're, we're going to look at a couple different layers of the epidermis, you can tell they're a little different, right? We see this deep purple, they're nice and round, and then they kind of get a little bit uh, spiky in through here. They have little spines kind of coming off of them. You guys see that the difference? We got round, then they get a little spikier. And then they've, now they've got dots inside of them. And then we get a little uh, higher out. We've got a, a, we still have a nucleus, but notice the colors changing. And then finally, we get to the very surface. This is the, the superficial aspect. And, and this cell here, this bouncing, fresh, baby, uh, bright purple cell, uh, dehydrates over about a, a five week period to the point that it becomes keratinized and is, is going to be one of these uh, uh, skin cells that will ultimately just get sloughed off of the surface of the skin. So the skin cells are born down here in the base and they work their way up over about a 28 to 35 day time period and then they get uh, up to the uh, keratinized uh, layer, what we also call the corneal layer. They call this the corneum, and they call this the base. Okay. So anyhow, we'll look at that in more detail in just a second. Before we do, again, um, I wanted to, to mention that most of the cells we see are purple, meaning most of these cells are keratinocytes, which I mentioned a few minutes ago. We also do have a melanocyte. Melanocytes protect the dermis from ultraviolet radiation. Tactile epithelial cells or Merkel cells plugged in with this nerve. So these help with the nervous aspect. So technically the epidermis doesn't have a nerve supply. However, it does have a cell that plugs in 
uh, or that a nerve plugs into. So there is obviously the need for our skin, our epidermis, to be able to sense temperature changes and pressure changes. Uh, so these tactile cells can help with detecting uh, pressure changes particularly. And I don't mean like air pressure, I mean like, like push pressure. And then the last one we see is this dendritic cell, and it's an immune system cell. It's going to help with uh, kind of fighting infection if we get a breach or if any pathogens have invaded. Okay. So again, you'll you, we'll, we'll discuss these layers next. I've already mentioned this base layer, and then we've got the spiny layer. We see the spikes here. And then we have what they call the granular layer. You can see little grains or granules in here. And then there's what they call a lucid layer. And then finally, uh, the corneal layer, that keratinized layer. So stratum basal, that's the base layer. That's going to be some columnar cells, usually just one layer of, of bouncing baby fresh cells, a column, even cuboidal, the column shaped. And then the next layer uh, we see, so they consider these to be maybe more column or columnar, the basal, and then we, and that's just one layer. Then we have multiple layers of the spiny cell, what they call the spinosum or spiny layer, eight to 10 layers. And then next we saw that granular layer, the granulosum. And that's just going to be a couple layers as well, two to four layers of, of granular uh, aspects that are going to help with um, waterproofing primarily. And then lucidum, we don't really see that layer uh, very often. Uh, we only really see the, the lucidum layer, the clear layer uh, with the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet. So only in thick skin do we see lucidum. So we really don't see it here. Um, if we did, there'd be an extra layer of kind of iridescent cells uh, in there. And then that last layer, or the most superficial, is the corneum. Okay, so stratum corneum, most superficial layer. And how does the epidermis grow and repair? Again, birth and mitosis and cell division takes place in the basal layer. And about 28 to 35 days later, uh, we get all the way out to the corneal layer where we're now keratinized. There are several hormones that help certainly with uh, uh, epidermal growth, and, and they would be called growth factors. So we see growth factor, growth factor, growth hormone. So um, if you're asked uh, what hormones help with growing, it's probably some sort of growth hormone. Hormones, there's a lot of them. We'll study several of them this semester and next semester. Um, but uh, the nice thing is a lot of them are named for what they do or the chemical they secrete. And again, uh, about a, a one out of 10 cells are going to enter into mitosis uh, every single day uh, in that stratum basal. Okay, and then I mentioned that DEJ or dermal epidermal junction is simply uh, the basement membrane uh, where we're going to see the epidermis and dermis coming together. So stratum basal uh, connects with uh, the dermal epidermal junction or the basement membrane, and then it connects to the dermis, which is what we also call the true skin. It's again the connective tissue aspect of the skin. It's what gives skin its thickness and its density um, and strength. This is a, a reservoir for fluid. Uh, we again uh, looked at the, the erector pili and, and hair when we're dealing with uh, thin skin. We also see the sebaceous gland there uh, as well. And we see some skin receptors uh, as well, uh, tactile receptors or corpuscles uh, connecting to those Merkel cells. Okay, so the tactile corpuscle is going to come pretty far up, whereas we may have the lamellar corpuscles a little bit further down, sensing maybe more uh, deeper pressure uh, than, than just light sensation or light touch pressure. So different nerve endings. We, have, we talked about thermoceptors that pick up temperature uh, as well. 
Um, so wound healing, we have what are called fibroblasts. So uh, how does the dermis grow, right? The epidermis, we just have that basement membrane and cells just keep pushing up and pushing up. Dermal growth and repair is slightly different. Uh, we have a lot more uh, of a variety of, of different cells and of different structures located within the dermis. Again, we see blood vessels of blood supply. So if we do damage the dermis, we're going to need to get uh, uh, the blood stopped. So we're going to need some heme, what they call hemostasis factors or blood clotting factors. <clears throat> we're going to need to do some repair. So uh, fibers, uh, fibroblasts, right? We saw blast earlier means to build something fibroblasts are babies uh, that build uh, fibers. They're basically baby cells that are going to uh, help to build new fibers. Okay. We have what are called cleavage lines throughout the body as well. Um, these are the lines of, of organization uh, for the dermis and for the fibro uh, aspects, uh, the collagen fibers, elastic fibers in the dermis. A lot of our surgeons are trained to perform surgical procedures along the cleavage lines uh, of the body uh, to minimize uh, scarring. Then hypodermis, not technically part of the skin. However, we, we consider it uh, in this chapter, it, it is the, the connector, the link uh, of uh, the dermis and the muscles. So uh, the skeletal muscles, because what's underneath your skin, you uh, don't have to go very far and we can feel muscle there. And so the hypodermis, we're primarily made of fat, so it's a, a good insulator. We can also call it the subcutaneous layer. So it's below the cutaneous membrane or the skin. So they call, oftentimes we'll call it subcutaneous fat. And then we also see this term superficial, so above, uh, uh, fascia. And fascia is, is a covering of our skeletal muscles. So on top of our skeletal muscles, we have the hypodermis. So they also call it superficial fascia. A um, couple other items of note, uh, skin color, melanocytes are responsible uh, for skin color. They release uh, a protein called melanin, and there are a couple different types of melanin. There's true melanin uh, and pheomelanin. Okay, it just depends on what types of UV rays uh, are coming in. We have UVB uh, and UVA. Uh, there's a, a nice video um, in the Padlet, I would again recommend that you watch. It's very short. And most of the Padlet videos, I think there's only one this week that's more than like 10 or 10 minutes. Most of them are three to 10 minute range. The one on uh, UV rays, um, I think is only like three minutes. So, so yeah, go in and watch that one. It's really good. It'll explain a little bit about what happens with uh, melanin uh, and what, ha what uh, the different types of UV rays uh, are and, and how they affect um, uh, cell metabolism and the DNA uh, of our cells. Okay, so we have little uh, uh, melanosomes, our little pot, little kind of like ketchup packets of melanin that get released by uh, these melanocytes. And we see tyrosine, you maybe recognize that, that's an amino acid. Okay, so amino acid, tyrosine. Okay. Albinism is a condition where the individual lacks melanocytes, so they, they have no pigment uh, in the body. So we see uh, melanin production. Again, this is pretty advanced, so I'm not gonna spend much of any time on here, but you'll recall this little illustration, the melanocyte. So what they've done is they pull the melanocyte out so you can get a better look at it, and they, they cut open, uh, you can see these melanosomes. That's these little discs that are gonna, they're the little ketchup packets that contain uh, the melanin. So they opened up a uh, melanocyte, and you can see we've got melanins coming in. And what they do is they coat, uh, they find a keratinocyte. Remember, that's 90%. That's all of these cells of the skin for the most part. So these keratinocytes, uh, the nucleus of these keratinocytes are basically going to get a protective cap over the nucleus. So the UV rays can't uh, damage the DNA within the nuclei of the keratinocytes.
So kind of cool, uh, the, uh, the way melanocytes operate. Again, they kind of release a little ketchup packet with, uh, uh, it's more like a Hershey syrup packet and it kind of coat the, the uh, inside of the, it looks like one of those Ferro Rochers. You know, they got a little hazelnut in here and uh, put a little uh, hot fudge on the hazelnut and it'll protect it from uh, UV rays. So anyway, that's all just a side note. Here's some of the uh, tyrosine being that amino acid that leads to these uh, eumelanins and pheomelanins. Okay, so again, uh, regulated by tyrosine and, and tyre tyrosine A's. So we see the ASE, that means we've got an enzyme that breaks down tyrosine. And again, we can get age spots and uh, different cancers uh, by too much exposure. Our genetic code plays a, a major role, certainly, in, in all of this uh, occurring. So skin color is, is uh, a variety of, of genetics uh, and how the exposure to UV rays uh, increases uh, melanocyte activity, melanocyte synthesis, and then that determines the quantity of melanin that's deposited uh, in the epidermis. Again, that's physiology, that's side note stuff for the most part. Um, so anyway, we have other pigments, beta carotene, you think of carrots being orange, so that's, that's where that comes from. Beta carotene, it's contained within carrots. Too much uh, sweet potatoes or oranges, or not oranges, too much sweet potatoes or carrots and for a baby can kind of turn their skin a little bit orange. Okay. Hemoglobin, of course, is in blood. That, that's what, uh, that can cause uh, redness of the skin, especially if you're, you're embarrassed or something, uh, if, or if stress, uh, blood pressure goes up. And then cyanosis is when the skin turns blue, and that could be down the center because they're choking on something, or it could be out in the nail beds. We call that periphery or peripheral cyanosis. And then there are other aspects of skin pigment, uh, cosmetics, tattoos, of course, uh, jaundice, that's a big problem uh, with, with the pancreas and with the liver and bile. Uh, let's see, and why do you even have skin? Again, it's a physical barrier, uh, chemical issues as they arise. Uh, it's another barrier for those, uh, mechanical traumas, uh, heat regulation, certainly. So for the, just the protection function, we see microorganisms, chemicals, mechanical trauma, UV radiation. Um, there's that surface uh, film on the skin as well that acts as like an antibacterial. Uh, it's acidic, so a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, the enzymatic activity that may be a pathogen, a bacterium, for instance, may be utilizing to survive, won't survive because of, of that film. Um, so yeah, we have plenty of what we call good bacteria or resident bacteria or normal flora. So we don't want to go overboard on the antibacterials. Uh, we do want to use them certainly now if we go out and come back. You want to use uh, soap, to uh, antibacterial soap. But if you're at home and you know you're just hanging out, unless you obviously your hands are dirty, but uh, you know you don't want to get too OCD about uh, antibacterial uh, soaps and and uh, um, uh, hand sanitizers. You you need them, but not in excess, because your body already has these items. And so that surface film gets uh, disrupted by the presence of certain uh, alcohols and other items, uh, ingredients that we find in some of these hand sanitizers and soaps. So be careful with all of that. Uh, let's see, certainly hydration. Uh, what is the chemical composition of this surface film? Well, from the epithelial, we've got amino acids, sterols, phospholipids, we've got a lot of stuff. From sweat, we can get water, ammonia, urea, lactic acid, uric acid. This is another way besides urinating that we can get rid of some of these items. And then sebum, remember, is oil. So oil is also gonna have uh, some of the components of that surface film. 
uh, some of the fat, fatty acids and triglycerides and waxes. The other, a uh, couple other functions of skin, sensation, flexibility, and excretion, of course, through sweating. Uh, sensation, we see the, the sense of touch, but also uh, senses of pain, uh, heat, cold, uh, temperature in general. <clears throat> One of the biggies that we see is vitamin D production. Vitamin D is stored in the fat cells so that that hypodermis stores a lot of vitamin D. And when UV comes in, it's going to convert what's called 7-dehydrocholesterol to cholecalciferol, which is a precursor to vitamin D. That's a, that's a mouthful. Um, so we do this a little bit more in physiology, but you should get introduced to it a little bit. They want us to talk about it briefly. Um, and blood's going to transport, uh, that precursor, uh, 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 to the liver and the kidneys. And then that's where we're going to get vitamin D, uh, produced. Vitamin D is primarily stored in the liver. And so again, we can get that UV could convert, to, uh, uh, 7-D uh, hydrocholesterol to, to what we call cholecalciferol. Cholecalciferol, you see the calcium in there, like calcium, vitamin D, right? A lot of items are fortified with vitamin D, a lot of milks, okay? So calcium and vitamin D go together. If you don't have enough calcium, <clears throat> you, you, or you don't have enough vitamin D, you're not going to absorb calcium. Uh, if you don't get enough UV, you're not going to get enough vitamin D, so you're not getting enough calcium that way. So you need UV, vitamin D, and calcium to maintain good, strong bones, to maintain good, strong heart, to maintain, maintain good, strong muscles. Yeah. So vitamin D production. So in the skin, the UV triggers uh, uh, 7D to become cholecalciferol. And then that goes to the liver, and then that triggers uh, the kidneys and the livers, uh, the kidney, kidneys, and the liver uh, to get uh, going on uh, synthesizing uh, vitamin D. Anyway, that's way beyond what you're ready for, but I still wanted to make, make it known that vitamin D, UV rays, calcium, another reason why we need a little bit of sunshine. But not too much, right? All right, immunity. Certainly, we've got the immune aspects, the phagocytes that are destroying bacteria. We talked about body temperature, uh, heat loss, and heat production. Um, again, muscles produce heat. Sweating uh, can take some of that heat away uh, through uh, what we call evaporation. Um, okay, so we call it evaporative cooling. Okay. So uh, we can also vasoconstrict or squeeze some of the blood vessels of the skin. So more blood, if, if we're in a, in a hypothermic, hypothermic, too cold, we can get some of the heat from the blood of the skin to be brought in toward the visceral organ. So we might get vasoconstriction of uh, the vessels during hypothermia versus hyperthermia. From our case study, we would see vasodilation, blood vessels would expand. Uh, to get that heat closer to the surface so we could get rid of it. Okay, so heat is lost through what we call radiation. This is the primary one I mentioned in the hyperthermia exercise or a case study that we do see uh, 70 plus percent of heat generated in the body from friction gets lost simply by it being hotter outside than it is inside. So heat travels from cool to hot. So 98 uh, in here, uh, or from, from hot to cool, I'm sorry. So 98 in here, 78 out here, heat naturally radiates from high temperature to lower temperature. So that's called radiation. Okay. Conduction and convection, we transfer heat to any substance that's in contact to, with the body. That's called conduct. So we're conducting heat just by touching uh, something or that's in contact with the body. Um, and then convection is bringing heat from a surface by movement of air. So like convection ovens have little fans and kind of circulate the air around and get the heat all the way around. So radiation, heat waves away from the blood and skin, conduction, 
uh, you're transferring heat uh, over to uh, the ice. That's why ice packs or spraying water is good. Uh, the fan <clears throat> creates what we call convection, transfer of heat energy to cooler air that is continually flowing away from the skin. And then finally, again, evaporation, part of that, uh, um, another way that we can get rid of uh, heat through uh, sweating, evaporative cooling. And again, this is all negative feedback loop, right? And everything that happens for the most part, except for childbirth and a few other things with breastfeeding, um, blood pressure are primarily going to be uh, negative feedback uh, loops. And again, it's the hypothalamus that regulates body control. This is, uh, again, this is what we looked at, the sensor, uh, the control center, and then the effectors. Sensory is the temperature receptors. Uh, then we take that to the control center of the hypothalamus and then out to the sweat glands uh, and blood vessels. Um, hair, we're not really inclined to talk about that too much. Um, we already talked about the sebaceous glands and the erector pili. That's all you really need to know about hair. Um, it does have a root and then there's a little hair follicle uh, as part of that, but uh, the WIDS doesn't require us to really do much uh, with hair, but there is some information in there uh, if you want to read through it. Same with nails. We don't really do a heck of a lot with uh, the specifics. Uh, we do have the whites of the nails called the lunula. Luna means moon, right? So you've got these little moons. And then the glands, we already mentioned the, the, these a little bit, the sebaceous glands for oil. And then we've got a couple different sweat glands. We have the apocrine glands, which again, we generally find uh, in the armpits and the groin and the head. Notice how the apocrines are, are connected with hair follicles and on the top of the hair and in our top of the head in the armpits and the groin area is where we're going to find maybe a little bit more hair than, than normal. And then the ecrine uh, sweat glands we find scattered all over the body. Most numerous, quite small, scattered all over the place. Apocrine, again, a little deeper uh, in the subcutaneous layer, right? So they're going to be down in with the fat. Uh, they're a lot larger. These, again, are going to be more in line with, with uh, armpits, top of the head. And because they are deeper in the fat, they tend to pick up a little more gunk. And so that's why sometimes we get kind of stinky armpits because there's a lot more blood supply uh, and a lot of the, the, the feeding that's going on here and even the filtration of some of the lymph. Uh, can get dumped into uh, these apocrine glands in the uh, armpits, and then that can certainly lead to some BO. Hey, again, sebaceous glands, those are the oil glands that are connected with our hair. They secrete sebum or oil. Okay, sebaceous. Ceruminous means earwax. So these are your earwax glands, primarily in the external uh, ear canal. Hey, and then a few things on uh, skin disorders and skin cancers. These are more FYI. I'm not going to spend time on them in here. There's a little bit on uh, Thursday that we'll, we'll talk about with wound healing. Uh, burns are some questions in your portfolio about burns and, and some of this other uh, some of the skin disorders. Not a heck of a lot. But again, refer back to some of this when you're working on your portfolios. If you can't find the information in your notes or in your book, um, but uh, burns, we have first through fourth, and this goes true with a lot of items in the medical world uh, regarding traumas. First degrees are generally going to be uh, the least harmful, so discomfort and redness, like a first degree ankle sprain is going to be a little discomfort, uh, a little bit of redness, maybe some swelling, but... Um, Within a few days, usually uh, we're, we're back to normal. So a little bit of aloe vera for a first degree burn. Um, mainly rest and kind of stay out of the, the stay away from more burning uh, items. Uh, this could happen just by touching, you know, the stove or the oven. If it goes too far in the heat, we may get blisters. So first degree deals with the epidermis. 
Second degree, we go deeper and we get into the dermis. That's going to cause pain because now we're dealing with nerves and a lot more nerves, blisters, swelling, edema. This usually doesn't require medical treatment, but it does require uh, some TLC, more TLC than a first degree burn. Uh, so, so maybe some, uh, again, more aloe and, and uh, maybe some uh, other types of creams and really just uh, uh, making sure we're hydrated, drinking lots of water and, and really staying uh, uh, protected from the, if it was from the sun, staying out of the sun. Third degree, we're going to go further than the, the dermis and, and uh, get maybe down toward the hypodermic area. This is a big problem. Third degree burns are going to be re requiring skin grafts more than likely. Um, the whole epidermis and dermis have been destroyed. Uh, sometimes the, the pain isn't quite as intense with a third degree burn actually because it actually burns through the nerves. So it still is extremely painful because nerves are everywhere. So if, if there's a burn down through uh, those layers, well, there's going to be tissue maybe nearby that is affected by the that burn. So either way, it's going to be painful as can be. Um, but anyhow, that's going to skin graft stuff and uh, maybe a, months in a hospital. Fourth degree, we go past the hypodermis. Now we're burning muscles and maybe bone. This is probably a death type deal. Or that's not good. Um, so anyway, Usually once you get past third degree and into the fourth degree, your outlook or prognosis is pretty bad. Um, rule of nines has to do with estimating the amount of burn percentage on uh, an adult. Okay, so again, the burn area is so superficial, first degree. Um, you know, we go second degree, we get a little deeper down into the dermis. Third degree, we're now into the hypodermis. Fourth degree, we've gone all the way into the muscle and bone. Okay, that's it. I'm going to stop there. Um, we've, we've chatted plenty.